your series. Of Sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll start over again. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Megunti Cook River Citizens Advisory Committee. I am super excited and delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Nathan Fury. Nathan is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of New Hampshire. He heads the UNH Fish and Movement Ecology Lab, where his team researches the motivations and consequences of animal movements, particularly migratory fishes. His lab specializes in the use of telemetry to track fish movements, but also conducts investigations of predator-prey interactions, bioenergetics, and landscape ecology. So just that, I can have half an hour on with Nathan asking him, what does this all mean? Uh, tonight, we're going to look, uh, uh, do a deeper dive into the fish in the Mikutiko River and in Maine and try to understand the relationship between the ecology, the system, the health of the river, the wildlife, the fish, the bird, the insects, and all the goodies that um, healthy rivers can sustain in terms of ecosystem. We're going to have about a 30-minute presentation from Nathan, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers from the floor that will be moderated by Bina. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be put up on the website of the of the committee. Nathan, over to you. Please enjoy the presentation. Awesome, thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for for being here tonight. You know, it's a rainy evening. It's Halloween Eve, uh, so I'm sure you're all still picking out your costumes and getting <laughs> those ready for tomorrow for trick or treat. Um, I'm very excited to be here today to kind of discuss a little bit of my knowledge and, and background regarding migratory fishes. I kind of come, you know, obviously uh, south of the border, um, at least the, the state border um, down in New Hampshire. Uh, so hopefully that's kind of acting as a bit of a, a neutral party, if you will, um, but also give you a little bit of insights because our communities down there are asking a lot of the same questions your committee and your community is asking as well. So go ahead, Dina. Oops. And so just a, a few seconds about me, just to try to help establish that, that hopefully I know a thing or two about migratory fishes. Um, again, thank you for, for the wonderful introduction. My lab does work on migratory fishes that we're going to be focusing on uh, today. This has included uh, investigations on both Pacific salmon species as well as Atlantic salmon, uh, rainbow smelt. Um, but we also work on a variety of other fishes as well, including things such as Atlantic cod, uh, a variety of species in, in the Arctic, um, as well as a, a bunch of members of the char family, uh, including brook trout and uh, Arctic char and, and bull trout. And so tonight's focus is going to be on migratory fishes. Now I am kind of, just for all of your sake, I'm going to use migratory fishes tonight to refer to what we actually call in biology texts, diadromous fishes. So these fish that need to migrate between freshwater and saltwater to complete their life cycles. I'm just going to refer to them as migratory. Please know that there's other ways to have migrations as a fish that don't require you to traverse the salinity gradient. But for tonight, I figured it would just be easier to refer to these as migratory fishes. And then one of our classic examples um, is obviously uh, river herring, whether we're talking about blueback herring or, or alewife where essentially these adults are coming into fresh waters to spawn. That's where they're releasing their eggs. And then those eggs and larvae, they're hanging out in the freshwater system, developing and growing there. And then eventually those juveniles are going to head out into uh, the estuaries as a nursery ground. And then when they, they're feeling big enough and tough enough, they're going to head out to the open ocean. And they're going to spend a decent amount of time there growing big, getting big, before they make their way back into freshwater to, to spawn. And some of these fishes uh, are gonna do this multiple times. So again, things like an alewife might do it several times, same thing with an Atlantic salmon um, versus other species. If we were on the West Coast, a lot of those Pacific salmon species, they only get one shot. They're gonna, they're gonna do that migration back home, spawn and then die. Um, but here we tend to have what, uh, what we refer to as iteroparous species. That just means you can spawn more than once in, in your life cycle. So go ahead. And here in the Gulf of Maine, Northern Gulf of Maine or Northern New England, however we want to kind of slice it and dice it, uh, we do have a lot of good candidates for, for migratory fishes um, in this watershed and in the region uh, more broadly. I think you've heard quite a bit about river herring, which is actually two species, uh, alewife and blueback. We'll talk about more of that in a second. Uh, rainbow smelt, 
Uh, these are, are really cool species that my lab's been doing work on for the past few years. Uh, we'll touch on them uh, a little bit. Uh, American eel, uh, they're a little bit unique in that rather than spawning in the, the freshwater environment, they're, they still rely on both salt water and freshwater, but they're doing the migration in the opposite direction. So they're going out to the Sargasso Sea to, to spawn. And then in our waters, we also have the potential for a couple sturgeon species, probably not for spawning here in the Baguntica, but they may use it like they do some of our estuaries in New Hampshire, just kind of as a uh, passing by. So we've got both the short-nosed sturgeon and the Atlantic sturgeon. And then we've got striped bass uh, that kind of work their way up and down the coast. They're kind of a, a semi-anadromous species because they don't necessarily have to spawn in freshwater, uh, but they will if it's available. And then... Atlantic salmon. Obviously, we've got Atlantic salmon uh, kind of in your watershed and such by stocking uh, programs in terms of uh, landlocked salmon. Uh, but again, in their kind of traditional form, they're completing those, those migrations as well. But I wouldn't necessarily think of them as, as a candidate for restoration of this project. And then we've got the sea lamprey as, as well, a really cool fish that's kind of found all throughout uh, Gulf of Maine tributaries and, and up into Canada. So I'm going to touch on and try to compare and contrast these species a little bit. So I was getting a sense that that was maybe a potential interest to the community. But as we're kind of going through and doing examples, I will sometimes lean a little heavy on the river herring just so that each slide I'm not comparing these six, seven different species each time. Um, so river herring, go ahead on to the next one, Vina. Um, con consists of two species, the, the blueback herring and, and the alewife. So they are two distinct species, and they do have some differences in terms of where they really like to spawn and how they behave, but boy, do they look awfully alike. It can be really hard, even by a trained eye, if you're in the river, holding them in your hands, especially if they're juveniles, uh, to tell them apart. Um, I know folks haven't eaten dinner yet, but uh, we're going to see the dissection here. The best way to tell these apart is that the, the lining of their body cavity, what we refer to as the peritoneum, uh, is actually quite strikingly different, where with the blue back herring, they get that kind of dark, um, almost black, and sometimes it can be a, kind of like a speckled, please, silver type of lining. And then that lining in alewife is, is clear. So because they're so darn hard to tell, tell apart, and their timing of their migrations is actually very, very similar, we often refer to them collectively as river herring and kind of, kind of combine them. Um, across these species, the way, even though they all have that same definition, they all need to use freshwater and, es and, and marine waters, and then by proxy, they got to use estuaries as, as well. Even though they all share that requirement, the way they do that and the specific habitats they use vary. They're going to be different. So, for example, those alewife love to spawn in ponds and lakes, while blueback herring, they're going to prefer slower moving waters of a river or a stream. But they're both going to need to get or want to get as far upstream as they can get. So if you keep giving them access further and further up the watershed, they'll generally take and use that and kind of disperse across uh, good quality habitats. However, something like the rainbow smelt, they're not going to go as far upstream. They're kind of going, they're going to go to about the area known as the head of tide, so kind of where that saltwater influence ends in the estuary. And then if they can, go just a bit above that. So just into fresh water. And then we have things like striped bass, which oftentimes in a lot of systems, they spawn just as much in the actual brackish water, kind of that estuarine or, or weakly salty water, rather than going all the way up into fresh water. So we get these incredible continuums of, of the salinity gradient across the landscape. And then how these individual species are going to respond or try to use these new habitats as they get developed is frankly going to be different. Another thing they have in common besides that use of the salinity gradient is they're not doing well. Um, so the left-hand panel here, this is our side of the Atlantic. So that's kind of the US Canadian side of the Atlantic. The right-hand panel here is all on the other side of the Atlantic. So the European side. And it doesn't matter which side of the Atlantic Ocean we're on, these species just simply are not doing well. So we've got kind of a, don't, you can think of this as a relative abundance on the vertical axis here, and then through time on the bottom, or, or what we refer to as the x-axis, and you can just see kind of precipitous declines across these species. 
And a lot of these ones are the same ones that we just talked about a couple slides ago. Things like, I guess I forgot to mention American Shad. They're very closely related to the river herring as well. They just get to be a bit bigger and have a distinct uh, kind of migration timing. But then the blueback herring, the alewife, our river herring, uh, American eel and rainbow smelt, and then down here, um, Atlantic salmon, which we really only have in the state of Maine uh, within the United States now, and we only have Atlantic salmon due to intensive uh, stock enhancement efforts where we're putting out eggs, fry, par. So why, why have these populations fallen off a cliff? Well, unfortunately, that really unique aspect of needing to go from the ocean to the fresh water sets them up for these long distance migrations and then also brings them right into our backyards as well. So right, the, the vast majority of human influences occur near the coastline because that's where we have uh, uh, developed. And so if you have a dam and you don't have a fish passage structure, well, that's the end of the migration. That's as far as they're gonna get. So one, they're just simply not accessing sometimes tens, hundreds, or thousands of, of kilometers that they had access to, uh, but it can um, also mean that maybe what's right there for them to spawn isn't gonna be very good habitat either. And then the habitat that's remaining, maybe we're altering it in ways, whether it's through pollution, urbanization, um, sedimentation, uh, et cetera. We're probably having a lot of other negative impacts on the habitat that these fish can still access. And then some of these fishes historically have represented huge, huge fisheries. And some of them still contribute to fisheries uh, today. And, and we'll touch on that as well. And then, of course, we recognize here in the Gulf of Maine, our waters are warming faster than over 99% of the rest of the global oceans. Really, the only other waters that are warming faster than our waters in our backyard is up in the Arctic. So that's going to add some complicating factors <laughs> where it might be honestly hard to predict what some of these changes are going to be. But what we do know is that the more resilient that we can make a river or a watershed or a system, hopefully we're giving that system as much scope as possible to respond to these additional stressors. And there's a couple of dams in New England and along <laughs> our coast. Now that's, that's a bit of an understatement. We have several thousand in New England. Again, the, the McGunticook River is not unique in, in this nature. Um, there are literally thousands of dams along our, our seaboard. Um, and go ahead and, and click on to, to the next one. And they're going to have various impacts depending upon how far upstream or, or downstream they, they are. Um, I like this. This is a bit of an old map uh, from an older paper. Um, and it is focused on much larger systems, the, the Kennebec and, and the um, Penobscot. But what I like showing is, again, just for some of these species, something like a river heron, they're going to want to use as much of that watershed as available to them. So again, we're not talking about just a few miles like you are all considering. These fish have been really constrained in some of these larger systems by, by even hundreds uh, of kilometers or miles of, of river extent. Okay. So first, this has kind of already been stated, but these dams are going to restrict access. They're just simply going to prevent fish from getting further upstream. Now, I know those of you with the keen eye and, and those fish enthusiasts on the left-hand side, they're going to go, Nathan, what are you trying to pull here? That's no Atlantic salmon species there. That's a Pacific salmon. <laughs> but I show this because when we, when we see migratory fish on the nature shows and the videos and the movies and all that, Right? It's always the Pacific salmon trying to get upstream, getting past the gauntlet of bears and eagles trying to feed on them, right? And you always see these majestic, powerful, and I, I will even dare say romantic fish. That's another lesson, another lecture for another time. But these romantic Pacific salmon trying to get up barriers, we just see them launching themselves out of the water to get up these, these barriers or these waterfalls. Well, our migratory fishes just aren't that strong. <laughs> so they can get up barriers and they can move up gradients, but it's a very different set of requirements that we have um, for things like river herring or even Atlantic salmon relative to some of these Pacific salmon species. Now, other species even here in the Gulf of Maine are quite resilient and can get up pretty steep areas um, as well as through things like uh, fish ladders or even some dams. Um, so for example, American eel are really good at climbing up things. Same thing with sea lamprey. 
as long as you don't have hydro turbines that can take those spaghetti noodles and, and chop them up, they can usually do pretty, pretty well. And so then kind of the first option that you have is, well, if we want to get some access there, can we build some sort of structure? And so um, I know you are all considering a, a bunch of different options a, across the across the impoundments or barriers right now. But in New Hampshire, within our Great Bay Estuary and its tributaries, we are largely limited to what's known as a, a Daniel Fishway or a Daniel Fish Lab. So you can see here uh, by this overhead imagery that the fish would need to come into an attraction channel. It would need to figure out this is the place to go, and then it's going to weasel its way up. Uh, kind of slot by slot back and forth and, and get all the way through. Um, this is Mill Pond Dam in uh, downtown Durham where UNH is and similar idea. You can see that concrete structure on the far side there. Um, these can work. Fish can get through them, but it tends to be to a degree system specific in how it's designed, but two very species specific. So these tend to work for some species better than, than others. Um, so for example, if you can design it with the right gradients, it's probably going to be good enough for river herring, but not 100%. So that idea of this isn't a binary, it isn't just can fish get through it or not, it's what proportion of those fish can get through. And that often tends to be dependent not only on the design, but then also even just things like seasonal changes in flow. And then if you think about other fishes, like for us, probably less of concern for, for you all given the size of the system, but for us, I look at this and the, the attraction channel is literally about that wide. The sturgeon ain't getting up that, right? So that's just a, another consideration that you need to have. While things like eels and lamprey, I mean, sometimes they seem downright happy in those things, um, hanging. What's nice is that kind of, um, uh, FB has kind of provided a suite of options and you're really thinking about along this gradient of what you might be able to choose. And I, I completely agree with the way it's set up here, that obviously what's going to be best for the fish is just to have a regular river there. But that's not always an option, right? Because we still need to, to, to live our lives and or maybe just some, some dams you can't remove due to uh, a potential for flooding or whatnot. And then kind of at the, the weekend are those Daniel fish ladders where they're going to work some of the time for some of the stuff. Okay. And we'll touch on kind of like a pool and weir system a little bit later on as well. So one aspect to kind of consider is yes, the fish passage is absolutely critical. If fish can't get above it, that's kind of the end of the story. They just simply don't have access to that habitat. But even if they can get above it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dam isn't having negative impacts on that system that the fish might experience. So probably the, the simplest one to understand is just simply sedimentation. When you slow down water, it loses that ability to carry sediments. So you're gonna start having sedimentation further up in the watershed, but then obviously right against that barrier or dam as well. That's one of the things you have to think about when you take out the dam is what's gonna happen with all those sediments. Um, but then that means you're not getting sediments further down. Now, beyond just sedimentation, if we kind of break up the waters both upstream and downstream of a barrier or a dam, because you're slowing that water down and it's not moving or flowing through the system, imagine that just becoming a bit of a bathtub in the summer sun. That's gonna drive water temperatures up and the warmer water temperature gets, the less it can hold on to oxygen molecules. So the dissolved oxygen can go down pretty dramatically in these reservoirs, particularly as we're seeing with climate change, our, our summer temperatures increasing. Now, that pretty much occurs universally kind of across these impoundments. What tends to be more system specific is what happens downstream. But more often than not, we see some of that trickle effect because you do have those warmer, lower dissolved oxygen waters trickling over the dam that tends to have a downstream effect as well. Kind of the, the exception to this is that when you have these huge reservoirs out west that actually pump the water out from the bottom of the reservoir, then you can actually get the opposite, and then you're pumping a bunch of really cold water downstream relative to, to what's upstream. Yes. But this was actually flipped back. Sorry. One second. Thank you. Um, this is one of the considerations that we're dealing with in New Hampshire right now, where we have these fish ladders and 
and river herring are getting through them, but we're still seeing their numbers decline. Well, when we start measuring things like temperature and dissolved oxygen in these upstream parts, they're getting to conditions that are going to be harmful to juvenile river herring. And those juvenile, those eggs and larvae got to spend months in there in the right conditions before they make their way down into the estuary. So it might not mean a whole lot if we're getting fish up there, if then there's not enough good quality habitat for them to actually rear those juveniles. Obviously in really extreme conditions, this, this can be bad um, where you can get eutrophication occurring, just a, a plankton blooms, a phytoplankton blooms, and then die offs that eat up oxygen really rapidly in these systems. Uh, but again, this is, this is a photo from, uh, from California, and then we tend not to see this unless we're further down along our coast, kind of into the to Carolinas and down into Georgia and Florida. Okay, so even if, now granted, I'm biased, I'm, I'm a fish biologist, so when I see a photo of a river herring, I just go, oh, like that's, that's a cutie, right? <laughs> All fish are beautiful. That's one of the things I tell my students over and over again. But even if you don't necessarily look at a river herring or look at a rainbow smelt or a striped bass and go, oh, that I agree with Nathan, that fish is absolutely beautiful. These fishes are absolutely critical to our ecosystems. These tend not to be that large of body of animals. They're also relatively productive. You know, these species tend to have fecundity. That just means how many eggs they can produce in the tens of thousands. So producing tens of thousands of eggs in a single spawning event that means that you can have a thousand or more young come out from mom, essentially, or, or from, the, from that spawning event. So they're highly productive. And then because they're moving between freshwater and saltwater environments, they're then exposed to predators throughout the entire system. So on our freshwater systems, they are prey to a variety of, of bass species, bird species, including uh, great blue heron, as well as uh, turtles, such as snapping turtles. And then when they get out to the estuary, things like striped bass are known to follow around these uh, river herring schools. And actually a lot of fishermen along the coast will time some of their places where they go and fish relative to where those river herring migrate. But this extends out into the ocean too. It's not just about what's going on in our backyard. They're transporting themselves out in the ocean and actually spending a longer time out there. If we're talking about things like rainbow smelt, um, alewife, shad, blueback herring, etc. And in fact, some of the old literature suggests that back in the 1910s, 1920s, before we really started to see this precipitous decline in river herring, that we had, as well as before the major collapse of Atlantic cod that occurred in the 1980s and 90s, that our coastal cod populations would actually move inshore to wait for those river herring. And we're doing some work now on coastal Atlantic cod around the Isles of Shoals, as well as off of uh, Portland, Maine. And we still, even with how reduced these populations are, we're still seeing evidence of river herring in the stomachs of Atlantic cod. And then it's not just about fish. I can, I can admit it. There's more to ecosystems than just fish. We also do a lot of work uh, working with Shoals Marine Lab on seabirds, including the common terns. And one of the things that we see very consistently year after year is that these common terns are bringing back to their chicks, that's what you're seeing here, herons. And now this includes both uh, river herring as well as the truly marine only Atlantic herring. We can't really tell from this because it just happened so darn quick. I can tell it's a, a, a member of the family Clupeidae, which is herring. So then what we do, really, uh, really yummy stuff before uh, dinner. All this white stuff you're seeing on the rocks, that's all turn poop. We can go and swipe that and, and do some DNA metabarcoding, then we can actually split that out so that we can confirm, yes, year after year, our common terms are feeding on river herring as well as those Atlantic herring. And so when we think about the idea, and I meant to mention this earlier, I meant to put a number to it, for most of our migratory fish populations, their abundance are literally at 1% or less than what they were before the 1900s, okay? And locally, a lot of our populations have just been entirely extirpated, just a fancy word for their gone. And so some folks, particularly at the University of Massachusetts, have been working on trying to quantify, well, what does this mean for, for the ecosystem? And because these critters spend a lot of time out in the ocean, they're exposed to our marine predators, whether it's cod or other members of the cod family, such as haddock or, or pollock or hake, 
Um, but then when they make those specific migrations into the estuary, other predators are going to focus on them there. And then when they get into freshwater, that's when the bass and the pickerel and birds are going to start hammering. We are talking about, I don't know if you can see kind of these, these numbers here, but we are talking about literal metric tons of nutrients and energy that we have lost per square kilometer in a lot of these, these watersheds. So a lot of these impacts aren't necessarily direct, but they are going to be occurring throughout the food web and both in the in freshwater, estuary, and marine environment. So hopefully I've made it clear that these fish help try to link uh, our freshwater systems to our oceans, and that's really important. But I also want to show you how these fish connect us across communities and really across the coast. So it was mentioned in the introduction that a lot of my research uses telemetry. That just means I surgically implant an electronic tag into an animal and I like to see where it goes. So I've been working with Drs. Uh, Matt Ogburn as well as my postdoc, Dr. Mariah Livernoy, out of the Chesapeake Bay, where they tagged individual alewife in the Chesapeake Bay and then we're able to follow their migrations. And for the first time, we actually got the migration for a full 12 months out of these fish. It's hard to see, but in the top right corner, we had a fish go all the way up to Canada. And then what we're gonna see is a bunch of fish come out now from New Hampshire and Southern Maine and go all the way back to the Chesapeake. So we're connected to those fish that came out of the Chesapeake and that means our fish are connected to theirs as well. Now I want you to just envision Go, imagine all of the tributaries going up that coastline and just seeing the same phenomenon come out. And so that way, even if it's a small watershed, if it's a gigantic watershed, if you just keep trickling more and more of that out, all of those predators in the marine environment are going to get more opportunities to feed. And then as those river herring are successful or other migratory fishes are successful, they're going to bring those nutrients back into the freshwater systems as well. And maybe not even from waters around you. They might be bringing nutrients from the entire Gulf of Maine back to your backyard. So there's been some other modeling work. I know this is a very ugly figure, just bear with me for a second. But there's been some modeling work that essentially said, all right, we turn the, the Gulf of Maine food web into a video game. We kind of define all of its parts and pieces. We say how much biomass is, is within all of those. And then, we go and we just jack up the abundance of something like river herring. What is that going to do to the rest of the ecosystem? And so all of their parts in their virtual Gulf of Maine are these critters here on the bottom axis. And then they're just comparing what happened when we didn't change the abundance of those river herring in blue versus red when we restored them. And what they saw is if you pump more biomass into a system, you're going to have things respond to it. And some critters respond proportionally more than others. So over here, you can see that the red bars shot up pretty high relative to the height of the blue bars. Those are our top predators, things like sharks, odontocetes or toothed whales, seals. So that made sense. If you put out more food, predators are gonna do well. But then there's also some other interesting ones kind of in this region here, where we also see some really big increases. This one is Atlantic here. So go ahead on to the next slide. And this is just because of kind of the complex relationships that we see around these critters. So here's their virtual Gulf of Maine and kind of the different uh, pieces of the food web that they built. But one of the things, or one of the groups of species that are going to benefit most, go ahead on to the next one, are those species that right now everything is eating, right? These are forage fishes, which means everything likes to eat them. River herring and rainbow smelt and shad aren't the only ones. There's other things like Atlantic mackerel, Atlantic herring, um, and as well as menhaden or pogies. And what these models are demonstrating is that if we can inject other options in here, things like river herring and shad, well, that's going to take the pressure off of these. And that's really, really important because these things are also valuable. Things like Atlantic herring and menhaden are the top baits right now for things like blue crab down south, but we're getting them in Maine. We're doing some work of monitoring uh, blue crabs in New Hampshire as well as southern Maine. It's a top bait for lobster, which is our single most valuable fishery that we have on the um, eastern seaboard, as well as uh, for pole caught uh, bluefin tuna, which is an incredibly valuable resource. So 
the more pieces of the food web that we can prop up or improve, we're going to see these effects cascade through the system. Go ahead. It's a little bit hard, though, for us to appreciate these river herring because none of us have seen a river boil with river herring or with rainbow smelt or with shad or seen sturgeon uh, make the rivers boil. Because these populations have fallen so far, we don't have a collective knowledge about this. It's hard to us for us to even envision what that might look like and what benefits we might get. So this is kind of a, a phenomenon that's described, I think, in this really important paper. Again, I'm a nerd, so I think any paper is important. But that how easy it is for us to just forget and then kind of lose that hair and just be like, well, we're, we're never going to get that benefit back. But we also don't appreciate what that benefit was. So go ahead. I mentioned this early on, but please just remember you're, you're not alone. These are all dam removals that have been occurring over the past 20 years or so. So as these dams age, communities just like yours are going to have to make these decisions. And everyone is going to have to be unique. Um, so I just wanted to bring a couple of examples. I know I'm running a little bit long, but I've only got about three more minutes of our watershed here that drains into Great Bay, our large estuary on the New Hampshire main border, and a lot of our tributaries had or have dams, and these communities are making similar um, decisions. So I wanted to highlight one in particular, which is uh, the Dover, I'm um, sorry, in Dover, New Hampshire, the Bellamy River. Um, this is a site that had at one point, I want to say seven barriers over two and a half miles. So somewhat similar, I think, to, to what we were all going through. Um, one, though, was dealt with quite a while ago. But then what I'm going to show you here, this was done in 2016 and 2019, where this is an old mill building. And they had a dam both on the upper side and the lower side of it. The upper side was relatively simple. You know, just block it out. They took a lot of care to try to make sure that there could actually be a pretty wide floodplain here. Um, and so go ahead and click on next. And that has actually recovered really quite nicely. Uh, we're seeing habitat renew um, along the sides of our floodplain, but there's also just that width for this river to just kind of move and migrate as, as it needs to and, and deposit sediment in a natural way. The downstream side, though, however, is a lot. It's a lot more complex. So what you can see here is after they, they removed it, um, the channel is quite narrow. And they think this is in part to just some of the stuff that was done while the, the mill building was constructed. And they actually altered the bedrock in, in some ways or chipped away or carved at it. As well as for structural reasons, they had to make a last minute decision for these pillars. You can't really see it, but they got extra wide boots essentially around them. And that constrained the, the fish passageways even further. And so it works. They saw fish getting through for the first time in over 100 years, but there were still questions of, well, how many? Again, it's not necessarily just a binary, it's what proportion. So right now they're still going through adaptive management, where every year they're kind of looking at this and, and trying to think, well, what do we do? And this, this year they were supposed to install a bit of a weir and pool system uh, kind of throughout this stretch. Um, to kind of reduce the gradient, but with uh, with the rains uh, that we had this summer, and you all had as well, it's been tough to to kind of get this stuff done. Another one that was a uh, community that just finished up its five year long process is Durham, um, which is uh, home to to UNH. Um, this is the Mill Pond Dam um, upstream made this impoundment that folks loved for recreation, things like ice skating. Um, as well as good habitat for, for aquatic birds and such. And so there was a lot of contention as to whether this should, should come down or not. Um, but again, this is a site that for river herring um, and other migratory fishes, we are seeing the water quality really decline um, upstream. So in conclusion, this isn't just a story of a single fish. Yes, we can kind of compartmentalize or categorize them based upon needing both freshwater and saltwater, but every species is a little bit unique in terms of how they're going to interact with, with their environment, what they're going to need from a fish passage standpoint. These fishes absolutely are just at a tiny fraction of what, of what they used to be. And these dams are not only going to impact that passage, 
which is obviously priority number one, is just seeing how far they're going to get. But you do need to think about what else are they doing habitat. And these migratory fishes, even if you don't think all fishes are beautiful, hopefully you can appreciate just all the way they link things together throughout the ecosystem, um, whether it's from oceans to rivers, along the coast, or again, kind of impacting or having impacts throughout the food web, including those top predators that we tend to care a lot about. And so with that, uh, thank you all again for, for sitting with me through a 33 minute talk, and I'm happy to answer questions. I'm going to ask two questions. <laughs> um, first of all, you mentioned something about the lake or the pond that they arrive at has to have a certain temperature for them to be um, happy there and do their business. Do you know what that temperature is? How do we test it? Where, who do we go to to see if a gun's book is viable for this? The second question was in your, when you noted the fish came out of um, Delaware and went up to New Hampshire. It looks like they pinged off the um, Cape Cod and followed the Gulf Stream up. Am I right, or was I just imagining that? I'll answer that second one first. Um, so absolutely, you saw that correctly, but you have to keep in mind, and again, it wasn't a big portion of the talk, so I didn't kind of go through kind of how the technology works and such. These are, these, since alewife are pretty small fish, these are relatively small tags. And so to be able to hear them, they've got to be within several hundred meters of a listening station we put out. So where you're seeing those fish go, they're probably doing other pathways too. Those are just those that we hear from because those tags send out a little sound signal that we can't hear, and then it gets picked up on those receivers. Um, but it does seem that they're staying relatively coastal. But again, that's where our receivers are. And there was, um, I could play it again, but there is like a couple of random receivers that are pretty far out in the Gulf of Maine. And we had some hits on those too. So they're probably using a lot of that habitat, which again means they're taking all of those nutrients and all that energy that are gaining while they're out in the ocean for a couple of years now, and then bringing it back in to your freshwater systems. And then if something like heron grabs it and poops it out and lands nearby, you're essentially getting that extra fertilizer as, as well. Now, in terms of specific temperature, I would need to go and just look at that, but I'm happy to afterwards, right? Each, each of these species is gonna have specific temperature and dissolved oxygen uh, windows that they're gonna want um, or to be able to thrive. Now for dissolved oxygen, it's relatively straightforward. Most fishes start to do bad when you get below five milligrams per liter, but then there's a little bit of variability there among species. For temperature, it's, it's very species as well as life stage specific. Um, so I would have to look that up and, and get back to you. Um, but in terms of you know, what we've been doing in our systems are just simply, simply using simple temperature loggers and you can even put them on strings. Uh, so you can essentially get something at the surface, get something in the middle, get something at the, at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, and we're collecting that data right now with Tim and do you, do you want to speak on that, Kofi? Or did you have a different question? So, yeah, we're getting some data on that right now. And so we'll, that'll go into our work with Interflu. Um, you know, it's watershed wide that we're trying to get a lot of that data for. Yeah. yeah. Nathan, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, you mentioned that the the fish ladders that we can build, they, they're kind of fish specific. Um, I'm wondering, can you build a multi fish ladder? where you could have different types of fish you could benefit from it? Or do we have to select the types of fish that are most likely to use it in our river system to build a ladder for them? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and communities, I, I think the way you framed that as, okay, do we want to just try to get as many fish through or are there just certain fishes that we really care most about? And, and people have made those decisions. You know, on the West Coast, for example, Pacific salmon are just so darn important that they make a lot of their decisions based upon those species. Um, you may or may not as a community have that thought uh, around a given, given species. 
Um, I would argue probably no Daniel fish ladder is going to be great for all migratory fishes, but then that's where some of those intermediate options, you know, I tend to think like a weir and pool system tends to work for a lot of species, might still not work for those really large bodied fishes, um, something like, like sturgeon, but again, you guys aren't, and I am hypothesizing here, but I would not expect you all to have spawning sturgeon in the McGuntacook. If anything, they would come into the McGuntacook to do some feeding, some hanging out, and then keep on, keep on going on. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that answers your, your question. Um, and kind of, I see a question over here, so I'm going to start walking while talking. Um, you know, one of the mistakes that New Hampshire made is that some of their fish ways before they installed the needle fish ladders was to actually use some of the designs that were really successful out west. And well, guess what? Our fish can't swim as strong as the Pacific salmon. So they would do these, they're called V notch systems, where essentially you have a big V kind of in the middle of the river, and then it's kind of like a step, another V, another step, another V. Well, the water just rushes down the middle of that so fast, a Pacific salmon can get through it just fine. They're finding, you know, a river and just get to the bottom and just sit there. Um, have you had a chance to actually look at the McGunnacook River and its, its situation, its gradients, uh, starting at the harbor? Um, we don't have an estuary, for example. And then the fact that the upper dams, um, the east-west that form the lake and the, are not going to be taken out. Uh, do you still think there's a prospect for for sea run fish given all those uh, obstacles? Absolutely, fantastic question. Um, and I will admit, I'm not an expert at your system, but I have tried to try to do a little bit of reading and, and kind of looking at things. In fact, uh, my wife and I were on vacation here this summer when FB reached out to me and said, hey, would you be willing to, to do this talk? And, you know, I think my wife was maybe a little bit frustrated that then we spent the next couple hours, you know, going and, and walking portions of the stream and, and looking at some of these barriers. Um, the, the short answer to your question is absolutely yes. Um, there is... Yeah, I, I do believe that sea run fish would, would come back to here. You do have the, the biggest challenge I see is that initial steep portion for sure um, at the harbor. It is it is very steep. Um, and I think the, the design teams are just going to have to continually look at what's going to be possible there. Um, but again, it's not the steepest one that, that I've ever seen, even for, for river herring. And those are probably going to be your limiting factor is the river herring. So even if it's too steep for river herring, American eel, I mean, God, I, I've seen them literally climb up something pretty much. Vertical, and you've already got them. So then you're just going to improve their ability. Yeah. Yep. And, and I believe an elver fishery. Um, yep. Which is, which is fantastic. So you're only going to just continue to benefit them um, as well as I wouldn't be shocked if you do get some rainbow smelt. Um, I think it's actually a pretty good habitat for rainbow smelt. And they're relatively um, strong swimmers. It's going to be more so just rainbow smelt populations seem to be doing so poorly. It's going to be how do you get them to, to colonize here, um, which I think is, is often a really broad question in terms of like, well, if they haven't been here for a really, really long time, or even if some of these species, maybe they were never here, how are they going to get back? Um, and so one of the really neat things, and I'm going to try not to geek out about it too much because um, I could do whole lectures on this, but with these, these migratory fishes, there is a pretty high degree of what we call homing, which means trying to go back to the same system you were born in. But this degree of homing really varies among species. So for example, I know I bring up the West Coast a lot, but I did my, my PhD and postdoc out in British Columbia. Um, Sockeye salmon, for example, are known for their homing. 96 to 98 percent of those fish go back to the exact same river they were born in. But then you go to other species, things like pink salmon, it can drop all the way down to 70. River herring is in that 70 to 80 percent range. Rainbow smelt literally jump between rivers in the same spawning season. It's, it's wild. We're, we're uncovering more and more about that. Eels, we don't think, have a really high homing rate. 
So that means that even if fish haven't been there for a long time, and yes, a good portion of the population is homing, there's always going to be a portion of that population that's taking a wrong turn, or maybe they're being rebels or independent or whatnot, that are going to be going and testing new habitat. In fact, you've probably had these diadromous fish testing your habitats, and you just don't even know it, because they test them for a while, and then they either aren't successful or they move on. Um, so hopefully, does that, does that address your question? Okay. Well, if we can come back to it as well. Other questions? Yes. Okay. Good for the Zoom people. Okay, fine. So um, the, uh, the Monotico Cat is a small river, really. I mean, it's only uh, four miles past length, but it's about 140 feet total from the lake to the harbor. Uh, quite a lot of barriers for fish to go up, whether they're assisted or not. Um, and we're going to have to have some type of fish ladder at the lake. We have to have another fish ladder at the Seabright. We have to have a fish ladder at the harbor at Montgomery Dam. Uh, and there might be some other assists for the fish along the way. Uh, realistically, how many, what percentage of fish, like uh, say alewives, do you think would survive that kind of a trip up to the lake? Yeah. This answer probably isn't going to be super satisfactory. Um, but you have to recognize that, I mean, one, in terms of those standards for slopes that fish can get through, through all the permitting and I'm sure the planning processes that have occurred, they're using set criteria for given species, right? So what rise over run can each species deal with? So I tend to, again, that's a little bit outside of my expertise. So if, if the state agency said, all right, fish can get from point A to point B as long as we give them this slope, in general, that's that's pretty good. Now, again, it's not going to be 100%. Um, so, for example, you know, there's been studies showing on, on other systems where you have multiple dams. Um, for example, like uh, there's a one paper I'm thinking of on juvenile salmon, um, essentially getting down or adult salmon getting up. Again, different system, different, different species. But you can have anywhere from 5 to 10% loss through each of those. But if you're comparing that to the zero percent you got now, right? That's you know you're going to have fish getting up each step, and you're going to be losing more and more as you go. But hopefully, also as long as you get them into the system, those ones that you're going to be losing, that you're going to be selecting those ones out, is largely through predation. It's going to be things that as those fish tire and wear out, you're going to have those predators coming in and taking them out and still grabbing those those nutrients. Um, no, no, no migration is 100% survival. Even if you had a completely unaltered system, there is going to be loss. Um, and again, these are highly productive fishes. Uh, again, they're going to generate tens of thousands of eggs. Your 99% of those eggs aren't going to make it, even, even in a natural system. And that's because so many things eat them. Um, so that's going to be a whole, I guess, a, a different survival curve coming downstream as, as well. Now, again, I'm not going to be able to stare at your river and be like, yeah, you're going to get 60% of the ale life getting up there. It's going to just be, it is unfortunately going to be very context specific. Um, but it's just simply the further you can get them up. And then I think when you have the opportunities to go from a fish ladder to like a pool and weir system, that's going to make that portion so much more easier for them, give them that much more energy to get further up. And I think it is a short system, but I mean, well, I was talking down about in the Bellamy River, we were talking about um, when those two dams got removed, we restored less than half a mile of habitat. And we still see fish spawning in those new floodplains. So they're going to take advantage of what you give them. Um, I can't tell you what is enough to make it worth the effort and the time. That's that's a decision you all will have to make. But if you give them an inch, they'll take it. If you give them a mile, they'll take it. Um, yeah, probably not satisfactory, but hopefully it helps. Yes. There are going to be some dams remaining in our situation. And I wonder when the uh, the uh, fish come to spawn, 
uh, if these areas where the dams still are, the water, I assume, will be a little warmer there. Is that going to be an inhibitor of some sort? Um, and then I wonder, too, uh, when we were talking about um, uh, the weir pool system, if those pools warmed up in as part of that process, and if so, what is the impact of all that? Usually, yeah, fantastic questions. Usually those pool and weir systems aren't super deep. So you're still, and there's still a gradient there, right? Um, so usually the flows through that still remains pretty consistent. So to the point, like you're not going to see that same degree of warming as you get above a reservoir. But certainly these spots that you do have reservoirs, it seems that you're going to be getting some data soon in terms of how warm do those stay. And then hopefully you've got like good engineers and, and folks that as you start to say, okay, well, if we take out this, this reservoir, or this kind of pool like area, but we keep this one, how is that water going to trickle down and, and what will be those, those influences? But again, you give them an inch, they're, they're going to take it. So even if they can't necessarily get all the way up into Maguntacook Lake, for example, because I know they're, you know, those dams aren't coming out, you might add a fish ladder or something to them. But even if you don't, they're going to come all the way up to that. That's also a little bit of, I don't want to say a, a misnomer, but something we're finding really fascinating. If if you talk to folks about what habitat ale life need to spawn in, they will say ponds and lakes. Well, I can take you to any of these tributaries in Great Bay, and other than the one, we don't have ponds or lakes. Even where we have impoundments, there's still not a classic ale life pond. And other spots, we don't even have fish ladders, and we see fish spawning in the river. Um, so again, they're, they're going to take advantage of, of the conditions that, that are going to be there. Um, you would need to do some of that temperature modeling, though, to see how warm are things going to stay in the Guntacook Lake, and then what might that be downstream. But it shouldn't be any worse than what it is now, other than the idea of just climate change is going to continue to, to crank things up a little bit for us. The West Dam. Yeah. The, the, the West Dam is an ideal location for a fish ladder. I think we've been talking about that as well. So I think when we look at the whole ecosystem, it's really interesting to, to think through the system itself, not just like tactical areas that are going to need to be examined in depth, each one of them, but really making sure that we create something that's going to be beneficial. And from what you're saying, I'm understanding that any incremental change will be beneficial for the fish, even if we don't get 100% herring or sturgeons or up the river, any improvement we can make to the system to make it a more hospitable habitat for those fish will be beneficial for the whole ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you do need to have some minimum success. Right, you do need to get enough through that you're going to get persistence of populations. Um, but I also I do I I don't think of it as an all or nothing. Like yes, I put it up there that the ideal is that it would just be a natural river flowing everywhere. That's not going to happen. That doesn't mean that you can't take meaningful change and, and improve what's what's there. It might be okay. Ill life can get this far. Rainbow smelt can get this far. Sturgeon, sorry, you're just not going to play in the Magunta book. That's, that's fine. You know, historically, I would bet you all had Atlantic salmon, right? That steep part is nothing to that, right, out of all these fishes. But I also don't see them coming back um, unless you really get efforts to come in here and stock those juveniles. Um, so I tend to think of these ecosystems as like portfolios, if, if you will, sorry, not to, to be completely capitalistic, but right, you, you've got different holdings or investments and we can't predict how any one of them are going to do. But if we diversify enough and you invest into each of those pots enough, hopefully in the end, you're going to have a resilient portfolio there. Um, and that can be thought of in terms of species, it can be thought in terms of habitats, um, etc. Because things are going to get more stressful. Right? The water temperatures are just going to continue to increase, and that means you need to have enough flex and give in the system that they're going to be able to respond to that. Yes? So you mentioned stocking, and, and I know um, a, a 
up along the Penobscot when those dams came out, there was a lot of work done in like two or three years beforehand to introduce tailwinds and so forth in, into the system so that that homing instinct would work and, and they would return. Um, and given that, that there are Atlantic salmon in the duck trap right next door, would it would it make sense for us to consider a stocking program for Atlantic salmon to see whether, in fact, you could bring them back into the mechanical? I mean, I love salmon, so I'm not going to say no to that, but um, I think you just have to you have to think, I guess, about the, the pros and cons, and really the cons there is just effort and, and time and money, you know, where stocking salmon is very intensive. Um, but it is also managed by the National Marine Fishery Service of NOAA. So you could always uh, consult with them. And then if they decide they want to do that, they, they'll do that. Um, or the, I presume they're then directly stocking into the duck trap. Um, no, it's all wild. They're all wild. All wild. They're all. It's the remaining wild tributary. Very yeah. remaining. The one. Yeah, sorry. No, I, I believe there's a history of the salmon being in the duck trap. We have no record of salmon ever being in the Conococ or the Blake. Okay. In fact, there's no history of alewife that we know of. It's an assumption that they were, but didn't. Nobody ever saw them climb up a ladder over or like over again. So. Um, my, my question was going to be though about other river systems. I read somewhere, I think the Grand Lake system up in uh, northeastern Maine, uh, there was basically a fight against introducing alewives in there because of their effect on other species. What will be the effect of alewives if they are introduced in Lake Conoco on the existing species there? Um, so one, absolutely, yeah, you might. We don't know. We don't have the ability to go back into time and know what was exactly here. In terms of my knowledge and feel for what these species like, I again would presume historically you would have had River Henry. Um, probably both blue back in the life, if I had to guess, um, as well as Atlantic salmon. Um, and then I would imagine rainbow smelt too. Um, again, you probably had sturgeon just come in and say hello um, and, and take off. And then uh, obviously uh, sea lamprey and eel. And you know you've got eel um, as, as well. So I would assume those, those all stayed here. In terms of potential impacts that ale life had, the, the one impact that folks tend to be most concerned about is that alewife, when they're in lakes and ponds, are what we call planktivores. Um, so they have these beautiful wide mouths, and they just swim through the water with those mouths wide. Um, and their gill rakers, which are just the bones that protect and cover the gills, their gill rakers are, are formed or shaped in a way that's really good at collecting out zooplankton, so really little bits in, in the food web. What can happen, because they're, they're good at taking those out, if let's say you don't have a lot of other predators in, in the system, um, but I, I believe McGunticook Lake is stocked with, with a couple of trout species and landlocked salmon. So hopefully not as big of a concern, but you, you do need to, to be aware of it and think about it. If those alewife are really, really good at taking out those zooplankton, those zooplankton feed on the phytoplankton. So the really tiny pieces of plants. And if those zooplankton aren't there to feed on the tiny phytoplankton, you can sometimes get phytoplankton increasing in abundance, which generally doesn't have like necessarily, a, it's not to the degree of like a bad biological or ecological impact. It's not to the point of eutrophication, but sometimes folks are, value, are concerned about property values, for example. Um, because now the lake isn't as clear. The lake is a little bit more green. Um, but this is very system specific. There is a, a lot of this work has been led by uh, uh, Dr. David Post. He's a professor at Yale. Um, he's had just dozens of papers on this over the past couple decades. 
Um, and he had a relatively recent one. And I want to say it was four lakes in Maine, even. I could be wrong on that. Um, where it was kind of looking at under what conditions does that actually occur? Under what conditions does alewife presence there actually result in um, the increased phytoplankton versus not? Because it's not, it's far from guaranteed. And in a lot of systems, it doesn't happen. But other, yes. I drove three hours today, so I don't mind running. <laughs> so I read an article last spring uh, where the reporter was interviewing a fisherman who was fishing for a herring. And two things jumped out of me. One, uh, the fisherman talked in terms of how many truckloads of herring he got this spring. And the second thing, he mentioned that the herring is being used not just as bait for lobster traps, which is what I had understood before. But it's also being used to make fertilizer. So if the stocks are as bad as those scraps indicated, and if we're talking about spending $20 million to take dams down to get more hearing, why are we letting people take truckloads of hearing out? Seems like the first step should be to stop that. Absolutely, great question. Um, and I guess my answer is that when it comes to conservation and management, it, it is a multifaceted approach. Do I agree that for some of our fisheries, we should have more stringent regulations? Yes. Does that mean we shouldn't also be restoring things to try to increase these populations in, in other ways? Because the idea of using them as bait and as fertilizer, I mean, those are commercial uses. Those generate jobs. Those generate money. Why would we not want to do more of that? I certainly understand the angle of, well, if they're not doing well, protect them. It might, I would also be curious to know how much of that was river herring versus Atlantic herring um, as, as well. So Atlantic herring are closely related in the same family, and they're migratory. They, they do migrations in the ocean, but they never come into the rivers. Uh, versus the river herring, the, the blue back of the wave. These are river herring. Interesting. Um, I'd be curious even what rivers are they're getting truckloads of river herring out of. I think um, this was on the St. George River in Thomaston. These are local lobstermen that depend on the bay. Gotcha. And they're a major part of the local economy. Can you yeah. So, so I think millions of dollars of investment. Yeah, so I think it, it yeah, it, it comes down to what do you value to? And these historically generated large commercial fisheries just themselves, uh, that we were using them not just as bait, but to, but to feed on. Um, the, the quotas for things like Atlantic herring and, and river herring are generally designated by a, a body known as the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, um, which consults with National Marine Fisheries Service and, and NOAA, um, but I can't speak too much to, to that process. Sorry, hand over to I had a list of questions here and you guys all asked them. So thank you. And thanks for sending in questions. Thank you for coming. Um, you know, these events are, we have a lot of them. So I appreciate you all. And I appreciate that you continue to show up and continue to ask questions. So stay with us and uh, yeah. We'll be in touch. You can always send me questions. Um, you all have my email. I think I can name all of you. Yes, I'll leave it. Yep, we're recording now and we'll post that on the YouTube and we will also put the, the PowerPoint itself up on our MERCAC website. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again for being. Thank you.